Conversations, Conversations with, with S.D. Booker. Booker. Welcome to Conversations with S.D. Booker by way of a toast to the men with S.D. Booker. We got a special guest. We got the man, <laughs> the, the myth, the legend, Craig Tennant. How you doing, Craig? I'm doing well, S.D. Thanks for having me today. Yes, yes. Let's give uh, Craig a round of applause, everyone. All right. <laughs> now, now, uh, I know you're right now what you're doing, your company is uh, engaging breakthroughs. That's right. Uh, but I want to touch on that, but I also want to go back and see how you got to this point uh, and, and what led you to our meeting uh, and, and our work we're doing with Leon Theodore with uh, Destination Known. Now, yeah. If an alien was to drop on Earth right now and came yeah. into contact with Craig, yeah, and you had to describe who you are, who is Craig Tennant? <laughs> wow, who am I? Well, like everybody, I'm a human being doing the best I can to uh, have a, a positive experience in this world. And, uh, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm someone who at the age of 58, and, and even sooner than that, but at this age of 58, I spend a lot of time focused on what seems expansive to me. What do I spend my energy on? And am I spending my energy on Thing, because we all do right. things that are meaningful that have some connection to purpose in them but just generally that feel like expansive like life is not guaranteed so I'm, I'm a guy today who's spending my time being curious about how do I keep more enjoying this experience in the world while taking care of what I need to take care of wow wow that's kind of my simple answer to a challenging question <laughs> What is Engaging Breakthroughs and uh, what do you do? So Engaging Breakthroughs is what I would call a career and leadership uh, coaching organization. So there's a, a small team of three of us and, you know, we work with mostly professional college educated folks to uh, help them move into leadership roles and I work with a lot of introverted people who, you know, don't have a lot of confidence and help them build that. And we have a colleague named Brandy who is a, a master networker who helps people make the connections that they need to to actually land the jobs that they're looking to move into. And she works with a lot of folks who are doing mid to late career pivoting. Go maybe going from one kind of career passion or something they've lost passion for to something that really is more in line with what they really want to do. It's, it's ironic you, you say that because um, recently I've been looking at doing a video on drifting, mm. you know, people drifting, and mm. it's so easy to get into. Uh, you get off course or not even get on course about what your purpose is, what your mission is in life. And you just drift, <laughs> uh, you just go with the flow, whatever is happening, whatever trend. Uh, yeah, real estate's booming, let me get into real estate. Uh, this is booming, IT's booming, let me get into IT. But you never hone onto what your true gift is, your passions are. And uh, it looks like you found that. Yeah, and it's been, you know, it's been a long journey. <clears throat> and I really love what you said there. I think when it comes to drifting, sometimes that can just look like, you know, I, I, I made a job or career at the age of 20 or 22, and I'm just doing the same thing just because that's all I know to do. And in, in a sense, I think that's like drifting, like not going for something that has some juice in it. Right, 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 right. Well, I think, so I that's, think uh, I, yeah, I think the thing is to uh, do what you want to do. I mean, if you're doing what you want to do, that's success. Uh-huh. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. definitely doing what you want to do. Right. And I wasn't always doing that because right. I was also in my own way. You know, that's part of the story. So I was, uh, I got involved in software back 30 plus years ago and ultimately got into consulting around implementing software for different companies. And, you know, when a job pays well and it takes care of and it's stable and it's predictable, you know, it can be really easy just to keep doing that. And it can be really challenging to find a way 
to do something that has passion and juice in it. Right. And, and if I'm doing something like in, in, in what I was doing uh, for a long time, you know, it's that energy just keeps going down and down and down. And that's kind of what happened to me. So I was doing that to go. I got involved in some personal development kind of activities. I went through a training program and it was all designed to look at the, you know, what's going on inside. How is this world experience going for me? What's working and what's not working well for me? And it was kind of the first time in my life I ever did that. And it wasn't until my mid thirties that I was like, ah, what's going on here after a divorce. And, um, you know, and, and it really helped me. I started to get grounded. My emotional intelligence increased. I started making better choices and it really had a great impact on my career. And yet I was volunteering with this organization and helping people in my spare time. And I had a huge passion for it because we were focused on something important. Right. And as I kept doing that in my spare time, the work itself became more shallow and shallow and less interesting and more Sunday afternoon, I'd get the nod in my stomach because I knew that I was going to get on an airplane and travel around the country and sit in a conference room for four days talking about things that I just really, frankly, didn't care about. Right. The reason I was doing that was because they paid me. And so about seven years ago, um, I was in that dilemma of how do I do what I love to do when I've got this, you know, the great career, if you will, that was sucking the life out of me. And it just so happened I was about to go into a training to learn some more facilitation skills, coaching skills. And uh, two days before I went into this week-long training, my phone and it was my brother calling. I hadn't heard from him in a while. And I was a little surprised. And it turned out that it was his partner telling me that he had just, my brother had just died of a heart attack a couple of hours earlier. Wow. And so um, <clears throat> that really changed a lot for me at the age of 51. It's now, so, with my mortality staring me in the face, the career and what I was doing and the risks of leaving that sort of seemed to diminish. They went down and the juice for going after what I was trying to do to find a way to help people have a better experience right. just became like, okay, the risk of doing that is I might fail at it, but right. I don't want to be regretting 20 years from now, looking back and going, you know, what did I do? So, the last four and a half years since about February 2018, when I left that career and, and founded Engaging Breakthroughs, have been nothing less than exhilarating. Right. Like right. not boring in any way or form and really challenging, but in a way possible. Wow, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, you you just Thank described you. what what most people are experiencing. They're doing things they don't want to do. And they're doing it for the money. Uh, I've been there. Um, yeah. I can't say I'm totally out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, out of that room. But I'm. I see the light. I see the light. And this is one of the reasons I'm doing this. Uh, one one of the reasons yeah. I, I write books. That's my passion and gift. So yeah. I do see the light. So I commend you uh, for doing that. You know, Thank I you. tell people, um, if you you know they worry about money, and I, I get it. I, you know, you, you have to have money to live on this earth, uh, I get it. Uh, but I just truly believe if you do what you're supposed to be doing on this earth, the money will follow you. You will attract the money. Uh, I don't know, call me naive, I don't know, but I, I really believe that, that the money will come if you're lined up doing what you're supposed to do. Um, aside from my advice to people, I mean, what can you tell people to really, get out there and take that step to, to trust their gut and do what they're supposed to do. There's a lot of miserable people, you know, walking around that's just out of place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first I, I just, uh, I really want to acknowledge you for, you know, the things that you are doing and that, you know, so you're a perfect example, I think of maybe my answer to that question, right. Is, 
pay attention. You know, so I think you, earlier you spoke about people drifting. And I think sometimes drifting is I get stuck so much in the patterns of repetition of things that I do. And even in the thoughts, maybe critical thoughts that I have in my head, that I stop paying attention. I stop noticing. And so I think the first step is like really notice, really pay attention to where do I have discontent? Where, where am I not happy in my, particularly in my career? And then, and start to then seek out the longing. What is it that, you know, what is it that would make me have more energy, you know? So when I think about what you're doing is you've got a toast to the men, you spent time writing and publishing a book. And so you, you had to have something around that, some juice around that, something that had you pulling you forward into it, right? Yes, no doubt. It wasn't like, oh man, I got to go write that book no, again. No, I look forward to it. <laughs> And now, you know, you've got a YouTube channel and you're making connections with people. You and I have had more and more conversations until last week. You said, hey, let's record, you know, an episode. I was like, great, let's do it. So things are pulling you forward, right? right? Right. You've got a career where you're making a good living. And my guess is that doing those things that you're doing outside of work that bring you a different kind of enrichment yes. also have an impact on how you show up at your career yes. doesn't mean that that's the thing that you want to be doing forever right? right right but a couple of things happen number one is you start to explore the things that you really like to do and you get to try them on and see and then if it feels expansive and light you follow it more i'm going to do some more of that right and it's also making that experience better but it's creating opportunities you're networking whatever it is trying on things that might be more enjoyable is a great way to get started even in the midst of i kind of hate my career energy right, right? right. I, and then and then cultivate you know like the stuff that feels great do some more of it keep branching off and following like <clears throat> if I use the term light or energetic or expansive, then do that. And if it doesn't, if you think about something or someone puts an opportunity in front of you and it's like, eh, then don't do it. Right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is simple. Um, now, what's appealing to me, uh, one of the things that's appealing to me is you focus on, I don't know if you focus primarily on introverts, but you definitely focus on introverts. Now, this is a word that uh, it's been around, of course, but it's really become prevalent and highlighted, I think, recently. I don't think I've seen the word introvert out there so much uh, uh, before the last, I say, three years. Um, I didn't know what I was, but I'm definitely an introvert. The more I start looking into things, I've been in IT for over 20 years. I make friends, I guess you would call them, while I'm on a project, but they're not long lasting friends. I'm not good at keeping in touch really. And it's nothing personal. Mm -hmm. I just like to, you know, to be in my 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 little, you know, hole and and think a lot and and, and process. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I've been in IT over 20 some years. I have no long lasting uh connections and friends. Mm -hmm. Um but one of the reasons I think it is, I am an introvert, but I was, I'm out of place when it comes to IT. I, I did it for the money. I'm doing it for the money. And I, I'm, I'm thankful because uh, it was an outlet to make a good living and, and support me and my, my, my family, right? So I'm not complaining. But now, like you, I'm in a place where, man, I really got to start doing what I'm meant to do. And so that's where the writing comes in. That gives me joy. Um, to the introverts out there, um, what are some tools, you know, they, they can use to cope in this world? Because uh, this is more, this word, I think, is more geared toward extroverts. So how can they cope in this yeah. world? Yeah. So I just want to address first that, that statement that this world is geared more towards extroverts. And I would say that um, I would agree with that, certainly in the context of the business world. Right or a career world that 
in general, it seems that people who have more outgoing personalities tend to have more opportunities, at least the perceptions that way. But I agree with that. that that's probably the case. And I think the first thing to, to think about around introvert versus extrovert is sort of maybe the, a, better, a good definition of it, right? So an, an introvert is more about how I recharge my batteries. Mm -hmm. well, and yet both introverts and extroverts from that point of view. So an introvert, I recharge my batteries by being alone. That's how I get my energy back up. So I am an introvert in that, that sense. Mm -hmm. And um, extroverts get their energy up by connecting with other people. And so my partner, Montine, you know, goes out to a party and then her energy is up and I'm drained. <laughs> right. <That's amazing>. so, <clears throat> well, here's a thought um, for introverts that it's maybe a little bit of a mantra that could be considered a tool. And it's maybe just a, a belief that says the way that introverts lead right so the idea here is that maybe introverts not considered as good leaders as extroverts and i'm going to suggest really a different frame on that okay. a different way of looking at that which is that an introvert's leadership is in um is in advocating for their own particular point of view think about introverts you just said it i want to go off and think about things and i want to be on my own and so what introverts tend to bring by doing that is a much uh richer and deeper perspective on things and so the way to lead is to think at you know my mission here as a leader is to advocate to be willing to stand up and say this is my point of view even though it's different right, right? so it's a little bit of what's happened for me the, what i do in my work is i work with people and i share a point of view about leadership how i look at myself how i look at relationships how i take responsibility for cultivating relationships how i lean into conflict all those kinds of things so i think that's the first thing it's just a thought that can be a tool that says as an introvert it's really important for me to be willing which means taking some risk to advocate for, to say, here's the way I see it. And that's how my leadership shows up. So that's one thing. And then like anything, tools for introverts, there's just so many, we talk about paying attention or noticing, you know, either getting some help from people who you know and trust or in some coaching services from someone like me, but get, this is in maybe even meditation, yoga, exercise that has me stopping and slowing things down and paying attention to noticing what I'm noticing. Because from that place of being aware of what's going on, being aware that something's not working or that I want to accomplish this other thing, that's what starts it all. That's what got you thinking about writing a book is you wanted to advocate for your own point of view. Yes, yes, yes. It's true. So does that help? It does help. It does help. Um, to see the value in being an introvert. Yeah, and we, yeah, and, and that, that's what we bring to the table, a richer, uh, deeper thought and a perspective. Yeah. I think introverts can, in some ways, read people better. And oh, yeah. uh, introverts tend to see what could go wrong better and, and make things safer for everybody. I think as a project manager, you've probably learned over 20 years how when you're working with a new group of people, how to make it safer for them to work with you to get what you want, right? Oh, definitely, yes. Yeah, so, you know, I think introverts bring a, a lot to leadership and it's important to recognize the belief that you have to be an extrovert to be a strong leader is just not true. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And, and people that, you know, may not realize it. And uh, although I don't agree with his politics, Barack Obama is an introvert, guys. So you may not know it uh -huh. <laughs> because, you know, he's out in front of the camera. And he has charisma. But, uh -huh. you know, the people that work with him, the staff says he's an introvert. He's to uh -huh. himself, head in the papers and the books. And so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, not very. It's so obvious, obvious to me that he's introverted for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, the way we met, 
is through, like I said, Destination Known. It's a nonprofit uh, created by Leon Theodore. And for you out there who don't know, Destination Known in a nutshell is a nonprofit which uh, provides tools and principles and guidelines that help educators and students engage one another. It shows educators uh, the value of the students and how to better communicate and teach them uh, and mold them. And it shows uh, students the value of education. So we try to engage both of them together and uh, have a, a good union. And so we provide different programs. I have a program. Uh, Craig has a program. I think there's up, uh, five more programs, I, I believe, seven in all. Uh, I believe I may be mistaken. Uh, no, that's right. Yeah. So um, great, great nonprofit. Um, and that's how Craig and I met. Now, you told me a story uh, a few months ago of how you were witnessing what was going on in the world with race relations. And, and you say, hey, you want to get involved. What can you do? It's just certain things you never, uh, I guess, noticed or, or uh, was, was aware of. Can, can you take us back to that? Yeah, I mean, it, so the that story about me and uh, race and my getting involved with Leon and Destination Known, you know, goes all the way back to growing up in the Boston, Massachusetts area and being in a, <clears throat> uh, growing up in a town where I didn't know any black people or any brown people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's homogenous there. All right. Um, so fast forward, without going through that whole story, um, you know, I did live in Atlanta, Georgia for about five years, and that was a really great eye-opening experience for me, a soul-opening experience. And then when I moved to Dallas, I just kind of fell back into where I was comfortable. And um, like I was getting nudges internally to go and, and step into a some way of seeing uh, step into something that had a racial component to it right. because i recognized that it was uncomfortable for me and this was before um george floyd's murder that this was happening it was probably the year before that that i was getting that sense and um last uh, january of 2020 they had a national day of racial healing the day after martin luther king day in january january 22nd and i just i saw something about this event at the dallas public library and just decided to go and they had breakfast at the beginning and i sat at a round table with about six or seven other people one of whom was leon theodore and uh, we exchanged business cards and ended up having a coffee where he kind of grilled me about what I was looking to do because he thought I was just trying to check off some boxes because they told me I had to do some diversity work <laughs> or something like that. Um, you know, and um, so that was kind of the beginning of it. And um, I've, I've been working with Leon. And then as we got into probably the August or September timeframe last year, I started working with the broader group of folks involved in Destination Known and um, I've had an opportunity to have some really great, deep, sometimes challenging conversations with Leon. We haven't had as much of that with the group because we're so focused on getting done, you know, what we want to get done. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a way for me to look at my racism. It's a way for me to grow and it's a way for me to, uh, advocate for my particular point of view as an introvert about what I believe will make a difference for young people um, and, and for educators and for administrators and how they deal with each other because I work around the ideas of emotional intelligence. So the passion for me is the wanting to make a difference, seeing the injustice probably in a different way as I've gotten older of systematic racism, which I believe there's, you know, I'm, I'm a white person. I know the thoughts that I have around race that have been in, indoctrinated into me from my growing up. So I believe some of that exists and I believe, you know, that it's time to change it. And I believe that I can help make a difference with it. And what I really appreciate, I was just looking at a picture that Leon posted with all of us that we had. I, I think you weren't there Saturday. Yeah, we took a picture Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. But just that, that was a great 
experience for me. And I'm, I'm making connections with people who are different than me that have different color skin, who have different cultures and we grew up differently and we're able to talk about it. And, um, it's rich for me. And I'm, I'm a really appreciative, you know, that I got the nudge to move in this direction. And, um, so that's kind of how I got here. Right. Right. Wow. You, you said a few, uh, important things there. Um, well, I'll take you back. I kind of, I can relate, uh, somewhat. I didn't grow up around, uh, a lot of whites or Caucasians. Um, mostly in my neighborhood was, uh, African-American and, uh, Hispanic. Uh, and I first started really getting to know, uh, uh, whites, uh, when I went to the military. Hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I, for the most part, there were no issues. I did get in one, one scrap with a guy and, and was, was ironic. He was on the opposite spectrum as I, he had never been around blacks and I had never been around whites. So I think we both played a part in that altercation just from ignorance and not knowing. And, uh, we ended up being good friends though. Mm -hmm. What well, was after the scrap, <laughs> you know, we had a respect for each other, got to know one another. Um, my, my white uh, guys uh, counterparts would uh, hit me onto Elena's more set. And uh, I think uh, smashing pumpkins was out. I knew nothing about any of that. Right. <laughs> so, and I would put them on to rap. And so, um, and I think that's what it takes, like acceptance of something different. Um, you don't have to engage is it's different and accept someone being different and, and having a different culture and creed and, and, uh, and, uh, coming together just on love, wow. you know? And, and I think that's the main thing. Um, but race is a peculiar thing, man. And I don't know if we'll ever get past it. Um, because it doesn't take a lot of, um, thinking, to judge someone on their skin color. It's mm -hmm. surface level and everybody doesn't want to do that work. Everybody doesn't want to dig deep below the surface and get to know the person. Uh, it's easier to just group everyone together based on skin color and mm -hmm. not have to deal with each individual as they come. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's a tricky thing. Now, okay. you mentioned racism. Um, mm -hmm. Now I get a lot of pushback on this. Okay. Uh, I think racism is thrown around carelessly, you know, uh, so it's going to be ironic that, <laughs> that you're on the opposite end of this now and I'm, yeah. I'm a black guy and I'm thinking it's thrown around carelessly, just like uh, love and hate. I think, uh, we've taken the true meaning and luster from those words and we just throw those words out. Mm. Like, like, you know, I, 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 someone says, I hate tomatoes. Like, do, do you really hate, do you really hate tomatoes? or or you know like you just don't like to eat them right you just like <laughs> yeah yeah you just don't like to eat them do you or do you really love that thing you said you love like we've taken a luster and racism i, I believe the word is thrown around carelessly hmm. and uh we got to be careful about throwing that word around uh when it really doesn't apply truly um what what are some things and and I don't think I've ever heard this question asked uh, anywhere. <laughs> From your viewpoint, before Destination Known, what were your thoughts about Blacks? And now that you're engaged with Blacks more, what are some, uh, some ideals that have been killed or some things you've learned? Yeah, I mean, I had, I had some of that shift occur in, in 1990, in the early 90s was my big, my first experience going from having grown up without really knowing any black people to moving to Atlanta, Georgia, where all of a sudden about 50% of the population around me were black and everybody, you know, I was working with and I ended up playing on the softball team where I was the only Caucasian guy on the team. Right, right. And so a lot of that shifted then. But then I found myself sort of when I moved to Dallas in 96, after those five years of, you know, really changing some of my perspectives, um, you know, just sort of falling back. So when I think about a couple of years ago, 
ago. I, I think it was probably um, just the, it seemed like it was more about a fear because black people don't like me because I'm white and tall and old. You know what I mean? Some of that energy. Right. So I'm realizing as I've been engaged with Destination Known, I don't, I haven't really had that sense. It comes up from time to time. I'm the only white guy here. And <laughs> I wonder what these folks think about me. But it's not a heavy energy in any way, shape, or form. It's just I'm, I'm aware of it. And, and I do want to say that the, I, when I use the term racism, I can connect back in with, as a young person growing up where I grew up, the, the, there was a constant background of commentary and uh, things that I heard and were shared with me mm -hmm. about black people. Okay. And I think that that stuff is, when I say racism, I'm, I'm talking about some of that, uh, you know, like beliefs that come from family in the area that I grew up in, that things that were just said over and over again, right. that I think uh, for sure created what I would use as that term. So maybe there's a better term for it. Because I hear what you're saying about the idea is a term that we just use but it doesn't really have meaning i do have some meaning to it around messages that i got about people who were different than me that you know, probably weren't true or it certainly wasn't true about everybody right right yeah right I mean, yeah yeah i think racism to me racism is uh when you can impede on my progression um a, bu mm. uh, a, a, a mm. bunch of white guys or a white family having a conversation amongst themselves about what they think of me has no impact over me. Now, if you can stop me from purchasing a home or moving into a neighborhood, that's racism to me. Yeah. If you can stop me from voting or owning a, a firearm because I'm black, that's racism. Yeah. But, you know, we got groups of blacks and black people that talk about white people. Yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> right, so I, I don't know if you would call it bigotry, or racism. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I have a racism example with your definition, which is yeah. was happened sort of around me. I, at one point in my early 20s, I rented this apartment for a few years in this building. And then, uh, you know, like two years after I moved out, the owner of the building was, uh, you know, charged with um, discrimination because she wasn't uh, letting any black people come into the area and rent the property from her. Yeah. So that that's was going racism. on around yeah. me. Yeah, that's racism. Okay, thank you. Thank you for helping me with that. And so part of part of what happened for me a couple of years ago around this topic and in getting involved in destination known was the awareness that I was going to and will continue to say the wrong thing or something that somebody doesn't agree with. Right. And that it's okay for me to do that and for us to talk about it like we're doing right now. Right. Right. That's what it takes. Right? That's what it takes. So that shifted for me. I mean, you asked me about what's changed. And there was something about at that moment there last year when I decided to get involved. I talked with Leon about this a number of times at the beginning about my discomfort and concern. And it was about saying the wrong thing and pissing somebody off. And he was like, well, you're going to piss people off anyway. So just say what you want to say. And so I've been willing to do more of that. Yeah. So that has changed for me. I'm more comfortable to say, you know, what I just shared with you. And right. you don't have to agree. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't have to agree. And the thing is, we got to be adults, uh, not be so thin skinned and understand that, like I said, Earth is a school. We're learning. We're learning and teaching. And everybody is not in the same class. Everybody yeah. doesn't have the same understanding. Yeah. I could be wrong about some things. I'm willing to listen to your perspective. Right. I may still reject your perspective or you may change my perspective, yeah. but I'm willing to learn and listen. Yeah. Um, I appreciate it. About, yeah, about you. yeah, that's that's what it takes. Um, and yeah, we can't change. One individual can't change the world, but it takes me doing my part, you doing your part, and uh, hopefully we make some, some progress. Uh, but uh, I think it's the ultimate test for uh, the human species.
you know, the ultimate. I don't think there's a bigger test for us to overcome than the race thing because it's just right there in, in your face, the skin color thing, it's just so easy to go to. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. So and differences in culture, right. in, in addition, the differences in culture and just what people respond to. And there's differences, you know, it's themes in some ways. And then, and then some of those are just blurring more with, you know, my son is half Guatemalan. My ex-wife is from Guatemala and my, my 30 year old son. And, you know, so he's kind of half Caucasian, half Hispanic. And, you know, like he, te he teaches me about rap music because he loves rap music. And I never listened. I listened to, what did you say? Alanis Morris said and uh, <laughs> whatever else you had there in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's great. You know, like that. And it's opened me up for sure. And um, yeah, it seems like part of my purpose is just to keep up being open and being willing to look silly and foolish and and bring what I know to bring what I'm here to bring, which is you've said it a time, but I'll say the word love. And it's just to hold people. People who I don't particularly care for, because I think that they're rigid on the other end. Right. For me to hold them with compassionate eyes, and that's challenging. It's really easy, like you said, to be critical and judgmental of people who see things differently than me. So my role is I'm just trying to be more compassionate, and part of that's being compassionate myself for not getting it right all the time. Yeah, and that's okay. And that's okay. Uh, yeah, and I think people got to understand too. Uh, there's not one type of white person or one type of black person. Uh, culture, I don't believe, is race. Uh, yeah. If I'm a, if I'm a black guy that uh, that grew up with you in Boston, Massachusetts. That's not the same kind of black guy I'm going to experience that grew up in Pleasant Grove, uh, Dallas, Texas, or Oak Cliff. So, so, but, yes. and, and, and vice versa, a white guy that, that, that grew up in the inner city of Dallas is not the same white guy that grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, right? So, um, mm -hmm. but what we'll do as people and what we have to get out of, uh, whites will shun that white guy and, and blacks will shun that other black guy, right? <laughs> and and we got names for those people, right? Yeah. And and uh, we got to get out of that uh, right. tribalism, and uh, right. yeah, we just got to get out of that. So uh, one, one step at a time. Well, I want to say something about that last part. Thank you for sharing that. By the way, I really I appreciate that distinction. Right. Right. Like, okay, a white guy in the north who grew up in the north, white guy grew up in the south, you know, vice versa. Right. But and. I think this is probably something that's more of an envy thing. And I'm going to say, yeah, it's not. I can't make the blanket statement. However, mm -hmm. my personal perception is that uh, there are more black communities of people who get together and connect with each other more than there are, in my experience, communities of white people getting together and having family reunions. It seems like that that's a little bit of something that I it's a broad thing and you're right it's probably different in the south than it is in the north so maybe it's more of an area thing right like a regional thing right, right. but I do I do see that in in black people of color African Americans that there's this energy of we all get together and and have these reunions of like that was I don't know that happening in so I, I'll say to me, there's that could be a little bit where race and culture sort of mix together a little bit. Yeah. I, wow. You, you said something. You said something great. But you know, surprisingly, uh, I think most blacks would look at that differently, right? But it's it's good to see your perspective. I've never heard that perspective. Um, now the family reunion thing comes in uh, while while blacks are so so big on that because of uh, uh, slavery um, and families being disconnected, and so that was a way for us coming together. Uh, this plantation with this plantation, or or uh, even post slavery, uh, traveling from states and trying to come together and reconnect and find out who's connected to who, and who's related. 
So I don't think that really happens so much in the white community. Yeah, that's a that now that is a cultural thing uh, with, with with blacks, right? Yeah. Uh, now. Yeah, and that's like one of those things that, you know, like you say that, and I go, yeah, that makes perfect sense, and it sort of put a sobering lens on it for me when you said that. It was like, fuck. Whoops. <laughs> hey, I didn't hey, take that it's, out. It's history. It's history. <laughs> It's history. Uh, I just dropped an F-bomb on your show. It's I hope okay. That's okay. It's okay. It's, it's history, though. You know, uh, it is history. Gotta, yeah. We got to face it. We got to face it. And uh, we got to deal with it uh, from a, from a, a uh, mature standpoint. Uh, right. You know, we got to deal with it. Uh, right. Now, on the flip side, uh, you may have someone to envy of that. And I, and I get that because that is a, a beautiful thing, those family reunions. Yeah. Uh, you know, something that was rooted in ugliness came out to be a beautiful thing. Now, on the flip side, you know, Blacks would argue, well, you guys don't have family reunions, but you come together as a community to make money and, and wealth and economics and mm. uh, build businesses, mm. right? So it's like, hey, you know, we can both learn from each other, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, why? Yeah, I like that. I like. Thank you for sharing. In family reunions, we yeah. can learn from blacks on that. Yeah, and blacks can say, "Hey, we can learn from whites coming together more on business and, and building uh, families and staying together right. as families and building wealth." Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, thank you for that. I just love, you know, this aspect of these conversations because they're unexpected. You know. Right. Uh -huh serendipitous moments unexpected pieces of gold in here like oh yeah these awarenesses that i don't have and um you know i think that's part of what you said about the arc you know, the white coming together around business you know it sort of fits into leon's challenged me since i met him almost two years ago you know like about my elitism and my racism. <laughs> he said, well, that's racist and that's elitist. So you're, stuck, you know, you're screwed either way. But I do have a sense for business. And that's part of what I'm looking to do here is to bring what I know humbly while also advocating for my point of view with some confidence and belief in myself, you know, to, to People who are different than me, where who may have, don't have as much of that opportunity, you know, for Black communities. So, right. part of the leadership coaching that I do is around how you show up in a way where you can command a good salary. You know, like yeah. that's yeah. important. Yeah. And I've learned some things about that over the years. Yeah, yeah, beautiful thing. Um, well, I know I got to get you out here. I'm watching this clock. We got to do. We got to come back together, Craig. We got to do a part two. I'm happy. This yeah, is great. We, I got to bring you back on. How can the people uh, contact you and follow you? Great. Uh, so our website is www.engagingbreakthroughs.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's a business platform, Craig Tennant, T-E-N-N-A-N-T. -N -N um, my email address is Craig, C-R-A-I-G, at engagingbreakthroughs.com. And so just send a note, say hi, find me on uh, LinkedIn or Facebook. I'm also on Facebook, live here in far North Dallas, and um, would be happy to spend some time visiting with you about, you know, what you're looking to accomplish and to give you a couple of good words of encouragement and help you any way I can. Hey, beautifully said. I respect you, Craig. I'm glad you. you came onto my platform. We got to do been this a pleasure. again. I'm sorry. I know we had to cut it short. Uh, you, you forewarned me. But man, this is this thing was getting juicy, <laughs> and it's okay. and it's good information for the people too. So, uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you. My pleasure. I'd be happy to schedule it again and come back on and talk some more, and you know, respond to your challenging questions. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Enjoy your day. And I think our next meeting is to I don't know this week sometime. I guess or maybe next week. I don't know. I think it's next week. Yeah. Next week. And I'll, hey, I'll see you then. Thank you, Chris. All right, SD. Bless you, man. All right, bless you. Have a good day.